Dr. Avalhosen has been one of um, the most central mentor in my career personally and has been a mentor to many of us in this room. He did his undergraduate um, education at UC Riverside where he majored in biomedical sciences and also got a minor in world history, um, which explains a lot about the stories that Jamil will tell. Um, he got his medical degree from UCLA and um, is a proud graduate of Harbor UCLA's residency and adult cardiology fellowship. He did adult congenital heart disease training here at UCLA under John Child and Joe Perloff. Um, and has been the director of our UCLA um, Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center since 2012. He's also the Streisand Chair in Cardiology since 2013. Um, he is, as Lee Reardon describes him, one of the funniest humans you will ever meet. Um, so please welcome Dr. Abelhosen back. So I take issue with two things regarding that statement. One, funny and two, more importantly, human. Uh, yeah, I'm actually not kidding about this. I had a cousin of mine show me one of his 23andMe um, gene analyses, and he goes, hey, cousin, this is very interesting. Look at this. Where is this? And I looked, and it said 2% Neanderthal. <laughs> <laughs> That's un unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to talk about the role of cardiac catheterization in single ventricle physiology. Um, Dr. Levy, in the next session, will talk um, and, and do a much deeper dive into the interventional options. This will be more focused on the diagnostic uh, portions of cardiac catheterization, and also we'll talk about exercise testing in the cath lab, and we'll touch on um, collaterals and things of that sort. I do have numerous uh, pertinent disclosures, but uh, I will show you the best evidence possible for everything and try not to have them affect me. Uh, I will not give away any examination questions today. If, for those of you, or I might, I don't know. I, I don't really know, but I, I will not intend to do so. Um, <laughs> So uh, let's just cut to the chase. What, are, what basic information do we need from a cardiac catheterization? When you take a patient to the cath lab who has a Fontan, you need the following. You have to figure out hemodynamics and oxygen saturation. So when the patient's on the table, you want to talk to your anesthesiologist and decide if you have an anesthesiologist. You could do an awake catheterization, obviously, which many of our patients, frankly, do not like at all. So I would suggest having an anesthesiologist, but talk to them about uh, the FiO2 that they are giving if the patient is intubated so that you're not having variabilities in the amount of oxygen that the patient is getting, which is going to throw off all of your calculations as well as your hemodynamics. You want to try to do the entire catheterization, um, the hemodynamic portion of it at least, in a steady state. So that is really key. The other thing I would strongly suggest is actually zeroing all the transducers yourself because even a few millimeters mercury uh, of difference here can completely throw off uh, this catheterization. So some really just basic stuff that you have to start with. Uh, pressures. These are the pressures you have to get. Inferior vena cava, you have to try to get it to a hepatic vein, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, we get a hepatic vein wedge pressure as well. Gives you an idea of how stiff the liver is. Get into the fontan, no matter what type of fontan it is, check a pressure there. Get into the branch pulmonary arteries, both of them. Not just a single one, but both. Check pressures there. Check wedge pressures in those uh, PAs as well. Check uh, SVC uh, pressure uh, as well. And then we get into the innominate vein um, as well. So that would be the right heart component of it. And then on the left side, you want to check an aortic pressure and also enter the ventricle itself uh, and check an EDP uh, as well as a systolic pressure. Angiography, some basic angios that we want to do in all Fontan patients. Inferior vena cava, large volume angiogram. We typically will do this in a biplane projection, and I strongly suggest actually doing that. If you're not going to do that, use rotational angiography, or you're going to have to take a lot of pictures in various views and use tons of contrast. So this is where a biplane lab is actually really useful. Why do you need biplane? Because a Fontan conduit may be completely kinked or crushed in one view, but look wide open in another view. So you just really should be taking a look at um, uh, this in orthogonal views or do a rotational angio. Same thing with the superior vena cava, same thing with the uh, pulmonary artery. You have to rule out Fontan pathway obstructions and assess for venovenous collaterals. We also will go into the innominate vein and look for something that Dr. Levy and I call our old friend 
on the venous side, which is uh, basically a collateral that comes off the innominate vein that will go to the left pulmonary venous system. And you'll see that in most adult Fontans if they've had a Fontan long enough. Um, aortography to assess for aortopulmonary collaterals and also going with directional catheters into the subclavian arteries, both sides, uh, injecting the lima and the rima, getting out even further so that you can get those uh, lateral thoracic arteries looking for AP collaterals. Uh, why is this important? As we go forward and we talk about transplantation, one of the things that we have found out, and actually, you know, um, Dr. Van Arsdale, to his credit, pushed us uh, uh, to doing more of this, which is, you know, coil embolize and particle embolize uh, uh, aggressively so that you don't have uh, heavy bleeding uh, when you go in and do the transplant. Um, a lot of the mortality associated with these Fontan transplants is around bleeding complications. And so there is a role for aggressive collateral embolization in this population, both venous uh, and arterial. Um, liver biopsy. Do you do a liver biopsy every time? Well, for nearly the past decade or so, we have. And, um, you know, knock on wood, <clears throat> thus far, we have not had any major complications. Um, certainly that is a possibility, but how do we do the liver biopsy? So the way we set it up is we go in through the right IJ as well as ephemeral venous and arterial approach. The right IJ sheath is used to allow us to go in and do the liver biopsy. So we generally will do a transjugular liver biopsy if the anatomy allows. So obviously you want to understand the anatomy beforehand. Um, usually taking about five samples uh, we used to take three samples, but uh, our non-diagnostic rate was close to 10, 15 percent, so we decided to take more samples, and that non-diagnostic rate has dropped off immensely. Uh, so we favor transjugular liver biopsy in our patients. Um, others do it percutaneously. Um, the downside in my mind to do it, doing it percutaneously is if you've heparinized the patient for any reason, or if the patient is on any kind of antiplatelet or anticoagulant agent, then the risk of the biopsy is significantly higher if it's done transcutaneously. Um, uh, be that uh, as it may, you know, th there's a role for uh, either direction, but we essentially want to get liver tissue and take advantage of the opportunity that we have the patient in the cath lab and we have the ability to get as much information as possible. Uh, one of the themes um, that I sort of push is that the catheterization laboratory is a laboratory. So it's a place for us to not only um, get the basic information that we need, but also to check the uh, patient for um, hemodynamic deviations and other things that may alert us to problems uh, going forward. So you'll see that that's a theme uh, within this talk. Uh, Dr. Reardon showed the Fontan subtype, so I'll go past that. Cardiac catheterization is absolutely essential in Fontan patients, okay? We, we do not have a way of getting around it. Uh, we have a way of getting around cardiac cath and a lot of other diagnostic cardiac cath, that is, in a lot of other conditions with uh, MRI and CT and echo. But you know what? In Fontan patients, in single ventricle patients, you still have to go in. You have to measure pressures. You have to measure saturations. You have to figure out or estimate your QPQS. You have to try to figure out what your pulmonary arterial resistance is. Because if you try to do a Fontan in somebody with an elevated pulmonary arterial resistance, um, then the Fontan will fail. If your LV EDP or single ventricle EDP is through the roof and you try to do a Fontan on that patient, that Fontan will fail. So you have to measure these things before you operate on these patients or attempt to convert these patients from uh, an earlier form of Fontan to a newer form of Fontan. Uh, Dr. Lax will be talking about that later, so stay tuned for that. Uh, thromboembolic risk. Uh, Dr. Lurie spoke about this. It's quite high. You see that picture right there? That's an RA to PA Fontan. That is a coronal CT angiographic view, AP view. And that's a big clot right there uh, within the right atrium. Now, if you didn't know about that and you just decided to catheterize this patient, you could run into some serious trouble pushing that clot out uh, uh, into the PA. So these are high-risk patients, especially older patients, especially those with RA to PA Fontans, especially those with arrhythmias, for having thrombi uh, within the Fontan circuit and within the pulmonary arterial tree. So I just go in assuming that there's going to be trouble, and then I'm just happy when I find that there isn't. Um, so 
I almost always ask, I don't actually do the TE most of the time now, uh, Dr. Lurie and Dr. Lin are the navigators on this particular B-17. Um, but, um, you know, we, we do a TE and we look at the entire Fontan circuit, um, basically from IVC all the way up um, to the branch uh, PAs and try to get a look at the branch PAs as well to ensure that we do not have um, thrombi. Uh, within the circuit. We also leave the TE probe in for a little while as we do the catheterization because we'll then put the catheters into the branch PAs, individual branch PAs, and then we'll do agitated saline injections in the RPA and the LPA while looking with TE to try to evaluate the amount of um, uh, intrapulmonary shunting, get an idea of how much uh, in the way of PAVMs we have. So those are just standard things we do in every Fontan we bring to the cath lab. Um, you know, just to follow up on the story of this patient with the uh, thrombus there, this patient uh, ended up requiring TPA, ended up requiring uh, nitric oxide, eventually on sildenafil. Um, a couple of weeks later, uh, after uh, resolution of the thrombus, Dr. Lax took the patient uh, to the OR, converted her to uh, an extra cardiac fontan, left with a fenestration at that point just because of the higher pulmonary arterial resistance, and then eventually a few months down the line on pulmonary vasodilators, went in and closed the fenestration, improved the saturation, and she's been doing great since that time. So that's uh, the course of something along those lines. Uh, how about uh, this patient with a fenestration? This young man had a stroke. And so again, needed to look with TEE, ensure there was no clot within the Fontan circulation, and then go in and eventually close the fenestration with an improvement in oxygen saturations. But the thing about the closing these fenestrations, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, because these are pop-offs for the Fontan. So if you are coming in with high Fontan pressures to begin with, and then you close the fenestration, your Fontan pressures will just go further up, and then you will cause the patient to go into liver failure. So um, just because there's a fenestration, we don't just run in and close it. We have to be judicious about how we uh, approach this. And uh, frankly, balloon occlusion, temporary balloon occlusion of these fenestrations um, is important. Venovenous collateral, same kind of thing. You know, these are natural pop-offs. So we used to be very excited about closing these. It was like the easiest procedure in the world and patient saturations went up and you felt really good, you walked out. But you know, it turns out that actually if you have high Fontan pressures, we could be, be doing harm. By the way, that is our old friend right there. That's the venous collateral that I'm talking about. Arterial collaterals, can overload uh, the system. So you can get over-circulated if you have a lot of arterial collaterals. That's one reason to close them, but the other one, again, is related to diminishing the risk of heavy bleeding at the time of uh, transplantation or conversion surgery. This is some compelling and relatively frightening data from the Mayo Clinic showing the risk of mortality there if you um, occlude these venous collaterals in patients who have Fontan pressures that exceed 18 millimeters mercury. Bad idea. Um, so what you uh, need to do in those settings is, um, I think, keep those fenestrations open and then try to drive down the Fontan pressures through other means like what Dr. Lurie was talking about. Uh, liver biopsy, this is how we do it. Notice there's also a stent in this Fontan, so you can actually um, go through stents. Actually, just yesterday we went through, or two days ago, went through a freshly placed stent that we had just put in to do a liver biopsy. So you can do this safely, even if you've heparinized the patient. Um, hemodynamics um, and um, uh, fenestration closures. Um, you have to be really careful with these. Um, and the reason for that is you have to kind of keep in mind that some patients, especially if a patient is a second or a third case in a day, may be coming into the cath lab dehydrated. So you're sitting there and you're getting numbers that are very favorable. But in reality, when that patient is living their daily life, these numbers may not look like that. If you look at the right panel, for example, you know, that patient started with a, an under anesthesia with a femoral artery pressure of 69 over 38, a mean arterial pressure of 49. And under those pressures, the Fontan pressures are 16. So hey, the Fontan pressures look pretty good. How about when we raise the patient's blood pressure to an actual physiologic number that he would be, you know, uh, um, uh, that would be more reflective of his daily life? Well, all of a sudden, the Fontan pressure is now 20. If you look at the left panel, 
you start out at 16, but then you give the patient uh, volume and you give the patient contrast, et cetera, and all of a sudden, the pressure is now up at 20. So I've really changed my approach to these. I used to try to sort of optimize them as much as possible to make them look like a great candidate for a Fontan conversion. Um, and I think that may be the wrong way to go. I think the way to do it is to actually see just how bad you can make this Fontan look by giving them some volume, uh, by raising their blood pressure a little bit, and getting a true idea of what uh, is happening. Um, you know, th there's a role for pulmonary vasodilators. I think uh, patients with Glenn shunts uh, have a fantastic response to pulmonary vasodilators, and this is an example of um, uh, one with nitric oxide where you see a, an increase in pulmonary blood flow and a drop in PVR very nicely. Uh, Dr. Lurie showed some of this data from Giardini, uh, improved uh, pulmonary blood flow and cardiac output with sildenafil. Role of exercise testing. I want to do this one briefly here. Um, and show you basically two cases um, uh, of that. Um, you have a patient here who has a pretty good um, exercise response. Uh, the Fontan pressures go up a little bit, but not severely. Um, the blood pressure rises appropriately, and this patient ended up having a Fontan conversion no problem whatsoever. And then this other patient here had a very different response. You look with graded exercise there, and what we have is a rising pressure within the Fontan uh, from about 13 at baseline all the way up to 30, uh, and we have a rise in EDP as well. So this patient was referred for transplantation and not for Fontan conversion. So I do think exercise testing is very helpful. Now, uh, Dr. Lin mentioned the role of cardiopulmonary exercise testing in the cath lab, and I do think that that is going to be a major part of this as well, um, uh, that sort of level three CPET uh, along with echocardiography uh, all done together. It's basically the ultimate stress test. So um, I do think that that's going to play a major role as well. So in conclusion, uh, patients with uh, single ventricle uh, uh, physiology um, represent a challenging subset of patients with long-term issues. Uh, cardiac catheterization is, I would say, an invaluable and very necessary uh, um, a tool not just for therapeutic interventions but for diagnostic uh, purposes as well. It's an imperative that if you're going to do this, please ensure you do the right angios and measure the right pressures to ensure the Fontan circuit is completely unobstructed. Uh, venous collaterals, I would avoid closing those in patients who have a CVP greater than 14 unless, unless we list the patient for transplant. If the patient's listed for transplant and is sitting in the hospital waiting for a transplant, we are knocking out everything. Why? Because our mission now is to decrease surgical complications. We've already made the commitment to go to transplant. So we have a diametric change in our approach at that point. Um, exercise testing in the cath lab is valuable, adds incremental hemodynamic data, as does volume loading and um, uh, pulmonary vasodilator testing. And then congestive hepatopathy is very prevalent, so we favor liver biopsy uh, in these patients. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry I went a little bit over.